Good day. My name is Dr. Mayepa, and uh, I'm a pulmonologist practicing at Greenacres Hospital. I'll be speaking to you today about the use of llamas in the asthmatic population. Um, these are the disclaimers. This is purely a non-promotional non uh, scientific um, presentation, and um, essentially this is all for us to learn a thing or two about llamas. Uh, please take note of all the disclaimers that are on the screen. The basic idea of, of where we come from is that in the beginning, the treatment of asthma was seen as, um, you know, this is an inflammatory disease and the backbone of treatment is essentially inhaled corticosteroids. Um, there was the thought at the beginning that, you know, the use of Saba, which is uh, your Astavent or your Ventese, will give you great bronchodilation. And uh, if you wanted more control of your asthma, you would then have to use a long-acting beta agonist with an inhaled corticosteroid. But as years have progressed and as research um, you know, has been um, going on, we actually try and we've discovered that not all asthmatics can respond to the basic or rather the, the normal standard of care that is the inhaled corticosteroid with a bronchodilator. We do see a proportion of patient which is 55 to 58% that have uncontrolled disease, irrespective of optimum dosing, ensuring technique, and ensuring that they are compliant with the treatment. Even if you were to, um, you know, aggressively treat your patient with these agents, it does not guarantee asthma control. And there's so many other things to consider. But essentially, you're stuck with the patient that you realize that the, this asthma is not in control, and your patient has an increased risk of asthma exacerbations. So adherence issues in asthma are always a problem. Um, asthmatics, when they feel great, they feel that, no, I don't need to take the treatment. But the problem with that is that's the next exacerbation coming, which may land them up in an emergency department needing uh, ward admission or even worse, ICU admission. So the need for effective treatment is important. And before we jump to biologic treatment, uh, which is your almost your extreme form of asthma treatment, you would want to exhaust the inhaler therapy that we can use, hence the need for a better treatment with those patients. And this is where we then started thinking that, you know, long-acting uh, long masterinic antagonists have a role in a certain portion of asthma patients with severe disease or uncontrolled asthma. And this is where um, research has started, and it's probably extrapolated from how we were treating COPD patients, but there's definitely a benefit in asthma. So why even consider using triple therapy? And the idea is that you are on maximal treatment um, using the cornerstone of asthma treatment, which is your LABA and your ICS, but we do know that there are patients that do not respond to the treatment, and they need um, an additional inhaler. So the other thing to also consider is that there is a, uh, a threshold that you reach when you've, uh, you, when you've reached maximum inhaled corticosteroid level. And beyond that, you know that there is no benefit for the patient. And we usually see that in your, uh, you know, your moderate disease asthma, where no matter what inhaled corticosteroid dose you give higher than the standard, you do know that there's no benefit. Hence, you know, Gina and all the researchers then started to go into the research of adding LAMA to the usual LABA ICS therapy. And there's definitely complementary effects in asthma. And the two major things which are important in an, any asthmatic is that the triple therapy improves FEV1, but it also decreases um, worsening of disease and attempt to control the disease, but most importantly, reduces exacerbations, which any asthmatic will let you know that this is probably the worst life altering um, events in, the, in, in their year because it's just one exacerbation after the other. So the potential additive effects is mostly in what happens besides the allergenic pathway that we know asthma to be, what are the other factors that make llamas to be so critical in the treatment? The basis of this is that there is an abnormal muscarinic receptor expression in asthmatics, which means that you increase the release of acetylcholine from the cholinergic nerve endings. You um, increase the stimulation of inflammation by the afferent 
pathways, and that increases the vagal tone of the musculature of the bronchi, which actually worsens the asthma and the narrowing, um, uh, narrowing pathway, narrowing of the bronchi makes it even worse. So that your muscular tone, your tone is probably higher in severe asthmatics when you compare to mild asthmatics, hence the need to add the llama. So it's very important to realize that there is a mechanism of action in an asthma patient outside of the, the very well-taught pathway, which is there is an inflammation, it's allergic driven, there's an IgE inflammation, and the inhaled corticosteroid and LABA targets that. But we now know that there is quite an abnormal muscarinic receptor expression adding to the constrictive um, you know, effect of the musculature around the bronchi further worsening the narrowing. So the presence of a llama in the triple therapy reduces that vehicle tone and actually improves the bronchi uh, bronchodilation. So the lava and the, the llama together will almost act like a dual bronchodilatory um, kind of um, method. So what are they? What, what are these agents that we're talking about? The long-acting muscarinic antagonists act by blocking the bronchoconstriction effect of acetylcholine. Therefore, um, the, the acetylcholine that is expressed in the airway smooth muscle. So it blocks the bronchoconstriction effect of it, therefore facilitating bronchodilation. Um, the, the ones that you would know are your glycoperonium, which is your breeze haler, your tyotropium, which is your handy haler or spiriva, or what you would know as four vent. And then there's eumeclidium, which is a lipta, but also there's the one that we are not accessible to in South Africa, which would be the aclidinium. So the ones that you are familiar with are the last three. Um, and these are available um, on the market. Um, medical aid authorization, though, is a different ball game altogether. It's quite a battle. So the bron dual bronchodilation that I'm talking about is the use, simultaneous use of the llama and the lava. And what happens is that you have smooth muscle relaxation, the respiratory muscle function is improving, and the mucociliary clearance is better because um, with an asthmatic that is not controlled, you have increase of mucus production. So mucociliary clearance is very important. And also the reduction of that hyperinflation is very important to give the patient that relief that they're able to breathe better. So the use of both agents definitely facilitates better asthma control and most importantly, symptom relief, which is important for the patient. So who are the patients that come to your rooms and they will benefit from such? With the GINA um, you know, stepwise approach of asthma treatment, the step four and step five patients are the ones that will benefit the most. These are the patients on medium dose to high dose of inhaled corticosteroid. They are on maximum dose of their LABA combination. And yet, with all the adjunct therapy that you've given them, these are the patients that need additional help with the LAMA because they are easily going to progress from step four to step five, meaning that no matter what dosage you are using, there is no effect in the bronchodilation. So your step four to step five patients are the ones mostly affected. The evidence is there. There are a lot of um, research that has gone into this um, combination therapy, but without um, going into detail of what the, the numbers mean, then the things that you should know most importantly is that does it improve the FEV1 for my patient? And yes, it does. 154 mils is, is a number, but from a patient perspective, this is great relief of shortness of breath and wheezing. So the improvement of FEV1 with quite a high confidence interval is, is very uh, reassuring. And also what we want to see is what is the, the effect on reducing asthma exacerbations, 25% reduction in severe asthma um, exacerbations, also very much statistically significant. And also there would be 42% reduction in episodes of asthma worsening. That When we say asthma worsening, we're saying a patient who would say to you, look, Doc, um, at night, I do use my, my Symbicort um, as a PRN dose, but I'm finding that more and more, I'm getting more short of breath and I seem to be using my, my, my Symbicort or my LABA-ICS combination much more frequently. That 
addition of the llama is actually meant to reduce the worsening of disease, which inadvertently reduces the risk of asthma exacerbation. And the research is basically showing that that is very much true. These are the list of trials, um, landmark trials that are looking at the triple therapy. And you can see that there are different types of LABAs that are used. From the first block, you can see that they are using formoterol, um, and then quite frequently, and then there is intercuterol in the last block that you see that is being used. Um, steroids that are used are anywhere from uh, metametazone right down to betlamethazone and, um, and the works. So there are definitely those in the research. And the main point, though, is irrespective of which LABAs and ICSs are using, um, and the addition of a LAMA definitely does improve the FEV1 and does improve um, the risk of asthma exacerbations, which is very important. Um, this is just further speaking about that and the, uh, the research that is going on. I always say that before you label somebody as an uncontrolled asthmatic, there are things that you need to consider. Um, and these are diseases that are associated with asthma itself, but also diseases that are coexisting in an asthmatic making the asthma worse before we call someone an uncontrolled asthmatic or a severe asthmatic. And just remember, asthma-related uh, coexisting disorders go from anywhere from chronic rhinosinusitis to nasal polyposis, vocal cord dysfunction, reflux disease, and to those that work in fields of chemicals and fumes and um, smoky environments, they can get occupational-induced um, asthma with exacerbation. And the other disorders that are nothing to do so much with the airways, except for the tracheal disorders, we must consider valvular disease because it can make um, um, your asthma worse purely because of a extrinsic compression of the heart onto the airways. So just remember heart failure, valvular disease, make sure it's not there before we label someone as an uncontrolled or severe disease. This is most likely in our adult onset or elderly patients. So we're talking about anyone from above the age of 40 that may have these diseases as a coexisting and that if they're not controlled can make your asthma worse. And underlying lung disease. Yes, asthmatics can get bronchiectasis and asthmatics can be predisposed to other lung diseases such as interstitial lung disease. Make sure that there's no coexisting lung disease first before you label someone as an uncontrolled asthma or severe worsening asthma. So what does your patient, the one that walks into your rooms, which patient needs the LAMA additional therapy in the uh, triple therapy management? This is a difficult to treat asthmatic who's on, on and maximal LABA ICS dose. We spoke about those that are in step four and step five. And the adult onset asthmatic, without divulging too much into the different phenotypes, or I would say for simpler term, the types of asthmatics, you must consider that your, your young patient comes in um, with the atopy, eczema. These are allergic-driven um, inflammatory asthmatics. They are IgE-driven asthmatics. Your adult onset is a different profile almost. They are patients who are not mostly uh, allergic-driven, meaning their eosinophils may not be that high, but they can be neutrophilic. So that patient will not maximally respond on inhaled corticosteroid, but just adding a llama in that patient may work. So just bear in mind that not all asthma patients are the same type. There are those that are non-allergic driven versus the allergic driven, which is the ones that you, you know, the younger patient, the atopies and the eczema versus the non-allergenic driven. And those patients need a different uh, mindset when you start treating them. And these patients may have rhinosinusitis, which may be allergic driven in itself, but it is not purely the nature of their asthma. There are also asthmatics who have a very poor response to inhaled corticosteroid, and they may be asthmatics that have developed neutrophilia. Those patients will, will come to you saying, doc, I'm, I'm very compliant. I use my treatment. Um, I don't get much relief when you give me prednisone. I don't get relief. You've increased my my dosage of my, my fixed uh, LABA ICS 
um, inhaler, but I'm not getting better. You need to look at that. Then there's a very sad group of patients who have had asthma for so long, but they've now developed an irreversible airway obstruction, which we call asthma with fixed airway disease. So they almost behave like a COPD patient. And those patients need a llama, very importantly. Then there's a very, very confusing and sometimes very challenging um, patient who is the obese asthmatic. The obese asthmatic is not a purely um, allergenic driven pathway. They are also IL-6 driven inflammation. So they need a multifaceted uh, treatment of approach, which a LABA ICS plus LAMA would benefit them greatly. But also they are the same patients that develop vocal cord dysfunction. They develop um, uh, reflux disease as well. Um, so sleep apnea as well. So these patients need you to not purely think them as an asthmatic, but always be on the watch for them developing diseases as the ones I've spoken to you about now. That's about it. Thank you very much.